This is the Get Global Young Professionals Talk Global Health Podcast, envisioned and created by the Irish Global Health Network and their student outreach team. I am your host, Megan Davis, communications and events intern at the Irish Global Health Network and second year medical student at the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. In this series, join me and my student outreach team co-host Aidan Desjardins, a microbiology student at Trinity College, as we talk to inspiring young professionals leading the charge in their respective fields, often operating in sidelines to their career, following their passions above all. Today we are excited to speak to Chris Jenkins. Here's a segment from our conversation. The role of researchers and global health practitioners in the Global North is really to support and facilitate and to um, support from behind and really to champion and empower and support um, partners that you're working with in the Global South to, to, to take a lead on, on the projects that you're working on together. I think that's really important in terms of um, changing power dynamics. Chris has over 10 years of experience working in global health. Most recently, he worked for Queen's University Belfast, supporting research on increasing access to breast cancer services in Vietnam. He has additionally worked in Switzerland, Thailand, and helped to co-found a primary health care NGO in Uganda in 2008, with whom he remains an active volunteer. Chris now works as a research manager with Ipsos Mori. Welcome to the podcast, Chris. Thanks very much. We'd like to start by asking our guests how they started in their field. So how did you get involved in global health? So it's kind of quite a long story, but so I'll try and paraphrase it. But as, as an 18 year old, whenever I finished my um, high school um, and before I went to university, I went with a group of young people to, to Uganda. Um, I guess using language that I know now, but I definitely didn't know then, I would say that we went on a needs assessment trip or a relationship building trip. Um, we basically got the contact details of, of a man called Dominic McGuire and um, we, we went out to, to visit him and some of the work that he was doing within um, his community. So we went out whenever I was 18 and didn't really have very much of an idea about what we wanted to do or what we could do, but um, met Dominic and over the course of a few years started to build a relationship with him. Um, and gradually it became clear that, that there was a real need in terms of health services within the, the area that he was, that he was um, working in. And, and we felt that was something that we could that we could support. So it really started off then with, with, with not really much of an idea about what the next few years was going to look like, but just a bit of 18 year old naivety and idealism and probably a lot of luck. But I guess that first trip to Uganda really kind of opened my eyes to a lot of kind of global health inequality, the community that we were working in. It was very evident the, the the health inequalities, particularly around treatable disease like malaria and HIV, and the impact that both of those diseases had had on the community. So really from there, I, I came back from that trip and I went to university and I kind of shaped my education around global health um, after that and started to look for different opportunities to get involved in my, with my career as well over the next over the next few years. But but that's where it kind of started. Thank you for sharing. So you've co-founded the primary healthcare NGO, Share Uganda in 2008 after visiting Kabira village as a student. Could you tell us a little bit more about your activism and volunteering in Uganda and what sparked the moment in which you decided to co-found an NGO there? Yeah, so so really after that first trip, it's, it's very difficult to paraphrase it because it went over such a, such a long period of time, but we, we spent a couple of years building up a relationship with, with Dominic and the community in, in Kabira. And it really just organically emerged that health services was something that there was a real gap in. Dominic was doing amazing work within education. There were some great community projects happening around adult literacy. Dominic professionally is a teacher. Um, his wife is also a teacher. So they're doing this amazing work in, in education. But it emerged that there was a real gap around health needs within, within the community. And we felt that was an area that we could contribute something to. At the time, the group that I was, that I was working with, a lot of people were undertaking their clinical and medical degrees. That's not a route I went down, I went more down public health um, route. Uh, so there was, a, there was a nice match as well in terms of some of the expertise that our group was building up and a need and a gap within, within the community. Um, so we just started to develop that organically. Over time, we started with some very basic health promotion work. We then built up into malaria prevention work, mosquito net distributions, mobile health camps, and then it all kind of has culminated now in opening up a primary healthcare centre 
in in Uganda that and that it's important to say all these projects are entirely Ugandan led um, by Ugandan medical professionals. We have a program that supports the education of Ugandan medical professionals as well. So us just kind of playing a, a, a role in in terms of a bit of a bit of advice where appropriate. Often it's not really needed. A lot of the expertise is generated locally. Um, and then finance and 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 helping to resource some of those those projects. So we we set up an NGO in the UK to to help finance um, some of these different projects and and goals that we had. We remain entirely voluntary within the UK and Ireland, which is a nice uh, aspect of remaining quite small. And we remain very youth driven within the UK. I don't know at what point I can stop saying that. I feel like thirty one is starting to get close to a line where I can't get away with that anymore. But I think in the big scheme of things, that's still youth youth driven in the UK, and as I say in Uganda, entirely driven by Ugandan medical professionals. Did you run into any barriers with the finance or access or anything with those efforts? Yeah, finances, and I like like I don't really see myself as a fundraiser, but in reality, that's probably the the main thing that Share Uganda does. Is we we raise money from different networks here, and we we send that out to support the team in in Uganda. And fundraising is really, really difficult. So there's always there's always challenges. Probably the biggest challenge is that our core costs are salaries of Uganda medical professionals, and people don't like to donate to salaries. People like to donate to projects. They like to donate to the build of something, to something that is visible. When in reality, and anyone that works in global health will 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 appreciate this. In reality, having a doctor there who has got a steady salary and is able to um, is able to be present in a clinic every day of the year. Or a team that is that is able able to be there every day of the year, is is the crucial bit. And selling that to donors is sometimes the the challenge. That actually, what we need their support in is is regular finance to support salaries, and also, you know, in terms of building our our, our organization sustainably, that we want to have you know reserves as well, so that we are able to commit to to supporting people for a long time and and in a responsible way. So that that's that's a big challenge, but. But our support base has been amazing for the last 13 years. A lot of different student groups, young people, and then just a real network of community, family, friends um, who have really driven a, a lot of that. So it's been nice to bring a lot of those people as well along in kind of the, the journey and, and to bring them into the partnership. Um, we've had people from Uganda have come over to Northern Ireland and meet family, friends, and that wider network. And again, kind of one of the real benefits of of something so small as well as that you can develop those relationships between different groups of people in a very authentic and natural way as well. So what do you think the biggest lesson you've learned from this initiative is? I think the biggest thing is around the importance of a partnership throughout all of it. You know, there's a lot of buzzwords in global health around collaboration, partnership, trust building, all that sort of stuff. But it really is absolutely essential to, to everything that that um, we do. You know, the the relationship that we developed with Dominic and his family and the community and the people that are involved, the people that run the, the medical health center is it's something more than just a professional relationship. It obviously is professional at its root, but um, there's a real friendship there and a real um, a lot of time invested into those relationships. And I think that particularly whenever you're talking about partnerships that that transcend linguistic, cultural um, differences that also are just between people that have such vastly different life experience. Um, you have to invest a lot of time into those relationships. So we've spent huge amounts of time over the past 13 years um, collectively as a group and as individuals as well. And doing a lot of stuff that isn't global health, watching football matches, um, going on walks with each other, having a couple of beers, you know, building up a relationship in a very authentic way. And I do think that there is a, a danger at the minute when um, I think I think a lot of the global health community now accepts the need for, for partnership. And you don't, I think that the, the kind of the era of um, parachute and predatory academia and parachute and predatory um, uh, research and global health work generally is, is, I think, and hopefully coming to an end. But the danger is that it gets replaced with kind of tokenism and and people maybe going in and doing a research project for one or two weeks and expecting to get results out of that or going and doing a global health project and 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 expecting results without putting the kind of the time into developing the relationships that really underpin it because with a good relationship you get not only trust between people but 
you also just understand and learn the con- about the context in such a more authentic and deep way, which ultimately then affects the type of programs that you're able to implement. So yeah, I think I think at its core, I think relationships, collaboration, all that sort of stuff is, is really important. And yeah, all you know, all all global health requires partnerships and it requires good good partnerships. And I think that's an essential part of any global health project. You perfectly transition to our next topic of discussion. So to talk more a little bit about developing partnerships and collaborations from your experience in both Vietnam and Uganda, what would you say is the key to developing good and equitable global health partnerships? So so the theme that I've just touched upon time is really important to actually spend time. So in Vietnam, I was working on a project around understanding how breast cancer services were delivered across Vietnam and looking at different barriers and challenges that a woman had in accessing screening services and then if they were diagnosed with breast cancer different challenges that they access that they had in accessing um, treatment so the first time I was in Vietnam I even though it was a, a you know it was a Queen's um, University collaboration with the Hanoi University of Public Health I spent a few months in Hanoi and and then over the course of four or five years spent a lot of time there and I think that was essential in terms of building up good good partnerships again across different languages, cultures, and different people's experiences. But I think beyond that, I think one of the most important things about developing good partnerships um, is to think about them. Partnerships don't, they, they don't just happen. I think you have to be reflexive and reflective about, about all about, about partnerships, particularly in a global health context. You have to think about your own positionality. You have to think about power dynamics within partnerships. You have to think, you have to regularly check in on your partnership and make sure that whatever principles that you hope under underpin your partnership are actually being lived out and experienced by the people within it. So you know if you're you know if you're interested, if you are wanting to ensure your your project is functioning equitably, you know, checking in with people and seeing is it actually achieving that. So to, to do that, you also have to have space within your partnership to have those sort of reflective, honest um, conversations and critical reflection. Um, and the positionality bit is really important. Like, you know, as I was doing breast cancer research in Vietnam as a white male Anglophone European, you know, possibly not the best place to do breast cancer research in Vietnam. So being aware of that, and understanding what your role is within a partnership, what, what bits you can contribute to and equally, what bits do you need to take a step back from and support other people to take a, to take a lead on, on that. So for example, I very rarely did an interview with a woman with breast cancer in Vietnam because it just wouldn't have been appropriate or pragmatic. So um, just being aware of those, of those different things. And I think importantly within global health work as well, it's also, um, and global health partnership building, it's a recognition that really the role of researchers and global health practitioners in the global north is really to support and facilitate and to um, support from behind and really to champion and empower and support partners that you're working with in the global south to to, to take a lead on, on the projects that you're working on together. I think that's really important in terms of um, changing power dynamics but also in terms of just ensuring that global health work is effective and, and is underpinned in local knowledge and, and expertise. So I think that's that's also important to keep at the forefront of your, of your mind. On a little bit of a different subject, obviously COVID has caused huge shocks to the health care system globally. How did your work with Share Uganda help support Ugandan medical professionals during COVID? Yeah, so we did the, the basic stuff straight away. We just, we ensured that our medical professionals had all the, the appropriate protective equipment that they needed, that there was protocols in place at the health center, that they were comfortable with the role that they were, that they were doing and that they, that they informed a lot of the practice. We always kind of said, if you feel like this is not safe for you, if that, 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 that there is not, I, I, I kind of pause there because it's obviously not safe for any health care professional but if they felt like it got to the point where they weren't um or they weren't in a safe position that they weren't didn't have enough support that they didn't have enough equipment that they told us that so we could put in place all all these different things to try and make it as safe as possible for our health staff uganda as a as a country has very robust disease response plans initiatives structures so we also just made sure that 
and I think that we were doing was 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 complementing that. And yeah, I think beyond that, you know, we, we were quite lucky where where we were in where we are in Kibera, in that there doesn't seem to have been a large COVID outbreak at at any point yet. There's been a few cases. Obviously, there's challenges in relation to data and 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 whether you can confirm diagnosis of of, of cases and all those sort of things as well. But there hasn't there doesn't appear to have been a big um, COVID spike um, within the area. So one of the things that's been really important for us is then just ensuring that our health centre keeps functioning and 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 provides services for all the other challenges that that we that, that we see all the time. And I think that's been one of the most difficult things with COVID is, is that COVID itself creates all these immediate challenges, but the knock-on impact and the impact it has on health systems and the other services that, that are disrupted by, by COVID is, 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 I think, unquantifiable at the minute. So I don't know whether someone's trying to look at that in, in different countries and what that, what that impact has been. But so, so we've really focused on trying to ensure that our health services continue to function and our health, our health center hasn't closed for a single day through the pandemic, which we're really proud of. And our, our, our team, the, the, the team working in Kibera have been amazing to be so responsive um, and adaptable, flexible um, in their approach to, to ensure that that's happened. Thank you for sharing these updates. So before we wrap up, what advice would you give young professionals entering the field of global health? Yeah. Um, Again, it's great that I'm at the point in my life now that people ask me these these questions, and it does make uh, you know the, the 31 thing again. Global health is a difficult career, I think, to go into for a number of different reasons. There's obviously all the different logistical things, and but I find it quite a challenging field to work in, in terms of just your own positionality within it, particularly coming from 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 the global north, and you're kind of you're aspiring to do something good. But you also are aware that, there, that that you need to be very critical of the field that you're working in, and there's big challenges within it that you that um, you need to be um, supporting a different direction that the field goes in. And I think, you know, I think that idealism probably isn't that useful, but equally, I don't think cynicism is particularly helpful either. And I think it's important that as we are necessarily critical of the field of global health, I think it's important that we don't fall into the trap of being overly cynical as well. I feel that at different points in my career that's happened where I've kind of felt that the, the field had challenges in it that were not being addressed, that was it a field that I wanted to work in. So I, I think it's important to kind of to be critical, but not cynical if that if that if that distinction makes makes sense other advice just you know there'll be loads of different opportunities that 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 come take them as you as you, as you can try to plan but don't overly plan you don't need to be in your perfect job by the time you're 30 i guess on the cynicism criticality argument you know to paraphrase um tony ben who was a, a labor politician in the uk said it's important to keep two flames alive the the flame of hope in a better world and the flame of anger against the injustice in it. That's a bad paraphrase, but it's essentially along those lines. And I think I find that quote quite helpful to return to. And I think the only other thing in terms of advice, and I think this is a, personally, I think this is a really important one, um, practice what you preach within global health. And I mean that in relation to your own health. Um, you know, we talk about the importance of mental health. We talk about the importance of well-being. We talk about the importance of work-life balance. We talk about the importance of a good diet and all these sort of things. But then, you know, we kind of work ourselves to death and create, you know, as if we're some sort of martyrs for for global health. And I don't, I don't think that's a particularly helpful or healthy approach um, to particularly starting your career. And I, I get that it's not quite as easy as that. We work in busy environments where often there's those things are imposed upon us by the organizations that we that we work for or, um, or the cultures that we, that we live within. But, but I think it's important to, to try and push back against some of those things as well. And yeah, you know, if we're interested in creating a healthier, happier um, society, then try to also replicate that within the way that we're working ourselves. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast, Chris. It was a very enlightening conversation about global health and partnerships. If you would like to learn more about Share Uganda, please visit www.shareuganda.co.uk 
And if you would like to learn more about the Irish Global Health Network or the Student Outreach Team, visit www.globalhealth.ie where you can sign up for our newsletters. Thanks again for tuning in.